Hi, this is Mark and Mike, and this is the Man to Man program. Today we have a special guest, our good friend, Mr. James Mark from St. Francis de Sales Oratory, and he's here to talk to us about music. So James, is music manly? Yes, but for a man to really engage with music and still be manly, he will need to face up to many of the same challenges that face him in other spheres of his life. He'll have to deal with paralysis, the same way that men struggle with paralysis in social and professional and romantic situations. He'll have to face his own vulnerability, which is sort of the key prerequisite to being able to receive beauty. Stay tuned. We have a whole lot more to discuss. Welcome to the St. Joseph Radio Presents live program broadcasting to you from the Rome of the West, St. Louis, Missouri. The program that for over 30 years has brought you eloquent speakers from across the globe to help explain, clarify, and evangelize the Catholic faith. Our program covers a variety of topics relating to current issues and occurrences in our daily lives. Now, with the aid of technology, we are able to bring the gospel message to the four corners of the world, where Christ himself did say, those who have ears ought to hear. It is our hope at St. Joseph Radio that through these programs, we can help evangelize the world and change one soul at a time. Now, here is your host to introduce today's guest and topic. Hello and welcome to Man to Man, a program hosted by my good friend Michael Hayworth, and I'm Mark Serafino, and you're listening to us on St. Joseph Radio, coming to you from St. Louis, Missouri, the Rome of the West. We welcome you, and uh, we have a special guest with us today who we will introduce to you momentarily, but we'd like to start by offering our program in a prayer. Thank you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. Let us pray. O eternal God, who gave us the person of St. Cecilia, a powerful protectress, grant that after having faithfully passed our days like herself in innocence and holiness, we may one day attain the land of beatitude, where in concert with her we may praise you and bless you forevermore in eternity. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Michael. Well, before I introduce our guest, uh, I have a couple of important announcements to make. First off, if you are in the St. Louis listening area today on October 14th, you are more than welcome to join us at our open house starting at 3 o'clock today till 5 p.m. So please make it a point to come to McClay Road in St. Peter's. Did I say a different month? October 12th. So, <laughs> you know, folks, I'm just not good with time and days. It's, uh, they, they go by on me quickly. And the other thing, and that this is um, equally but actually more important, and that is from now until November, first week of November, I'm giving some leeway for mail-ins. The word is no. That's the word of the month, no. No on Prop 3. Uh, it, it's vitally important that everyone within listening range of this who lives in the state of Missouri must vote no on Election Day. And it's also our civic duty to help our neighbors, friends, family understand why it's important that they vote no. So. For this month, no is the key word. But now, let's get to our special guest. Uh, we are joined today by Mr. James Mark, who is the music director from St. Francis de Sales Oratory. And James is joining us to talk about beauty and music and a whole bunch of other things. But uh, let's start by finding out, James, what could you tell our listeners about yourself and your background? Uh, please share. Thank you very much for having me on the show. I've looked forward to this ever since you mentioned uh, the opportunity. I've been watching the other episodes, and I really think what you both are doing here is very important. I also don't see too many other guys doing anything like it, so I'm, I feel very honored to be here. Um, and yeah, I just, the one request I have in the course of the conversation is one question you don't ask me, and that's, what do you do in your free time? Ah. <laughs> that is my least favorite question. So. What I do do, I'm the director of music at St. Francis de Sales Oratory, and that's, if you've never heard of it, an apostolate of the Institute of Christ the King, Sovereign Priest, which is an international religious order of pontifical rite with its headquarters in Grisigliano, Italy. 
Um, St. Francis de Sales has been called as a church building the Cathedral of South City, back to when it was first built, mostly because of its size, but also its representative uh, power. And uh, the oratory, or it became under the auspices of the Institute in 2005. So I am preceded by two music directors, uh, most notably Nicholas Bodkins, who held the, lo the longest tenure there for 10 years. And um, so it's a, an apostolate of the American province, which has its headquarters in Chicago. And what we do there is we have liturgy as our, uh, the primary charism of that church. So the music is primarily devoted to that. Um, but it also has uh, a second arm, you might call it an ambassadorial or evangelical arm that goes beyond the four walls of the church. So it has sort of a two-sided two music program. The first side, which is the uh, lion's share of the program, is uh, the sacred music, and that breaks down into essentially four, three ensembles and, a, and an, um, an educational course. So um, the educational courses for adults uh, that is a weekly chant class um, that's offered every Tuesday night, 7.45 to 8.45 p.m., adherent to the academic year. And uh, it has about 25 enrollees, not including the oblate candidates and the candidates for priesthood that stay at the oratory uh, during their discernment and formation. Uh, is that, this a class where the students learn to sing chant or they learn the history of chant? Very good question. It's primarily a practical skills class, and that's, it evolved into that. It, admittedly, in the beginning, we, you know, it was more of a full contextual history and everything. Um, but the the reason it got tapered more and more to practical skills is because, bottom line, we exist in a time at a juncture where, even though there is more or less a resurgence in tradition that's been recognized over the world, there's still a massive deficit in what I would call literacy in the notation system unique to Gregorian chant. It has its own notation system. And it's not just for decorative uh, you know, appeal, it's not just for nostalgia that we adhere to that system. It actually results in different sounds, the way it's sung. And because of that deficit, we are obliged to just try to put a little dent in it by increasing, uh, even if only by half a percentile, the population of even just greater St. Louis that can actually, when seeing those notes, sing what those notes mean. Hopefully increasing the number of people who might discern a lowercase v vocation and singing in a sacred music ensemble at St. Francis de Sales or elsewhere. So that's the mission of that class, is just try to get that knowledge a little bit larger. It's not taught outside of church initiatives, because obviously you don't go to a public school and get taught Gregorian notes. Increasingly, you're not even getting taught regular notes anymore. Well, that's true. Uh, so uh, we have to do it ourselves. And so anyway, that's why we have that class. Um, then we have what's called a preparatory choir. And I'm describing these in sort of a rungs on a ladder, if you imagine, entry point and then going up. So the chant class is intended mostly for adults. Um, families can come, though. We have some kids that are in it right now. And then we have the preparatory choir, which is uh, intentionally just for children. Uh, when people say, how old do they have to be to start? I say, can they sound out their vowels with or without literature in front of them? If they can do that, they're old enough to start. We've had people as young as four. It goes up to about mid-teens, um, where, uh, whereupon, if we've done our job, those teens are ready then to start singing in a, or swimming in a more mature environment, like the adult choir. Uh, but the preparatory choir currently has 40 kids enrolled in it. Um, it's existed now. We're going into our, we're completing our fifth year uh, of continuous growth. We've never suffered attrition. That's particularly rare that we would be blessed that way. So that's something I'm thankful for every day. I came directly from rehearsing them this morning to, to come here to St. Peter's. Um, then you have what we call ordinary choir. This is a new initiative we started this year, but it's not unprecedented. There are churches that do this kind of a thing elsewhere. It's a choir that's mostly adults, but that is entry level. They sing what we call the ordinary of mass. And for those who, if you were ever to come visit the sales, the form or the rite that we use, Roman rite, but it's the, the form such that we have an ordinary that is sung. Uh, you know these things, the Kyrie, the Gloria, the Sanctus, the Benedictus, the Agnus Dei. They tend to be, compared to more elaborate chant, they tend to be more accessible, require less practice, and do well in what I would call strength in numbers singing. So it's what in other settings would admittedly be called a y'all come choir. It's, sure. a, it's, it's <laughs> You don't need to have a prerequisite. Um, there's so many voices in it that even if you're off, you're, you're on. We're, we're, we, we create what's called heterophony. <laughs> All right? and, and so that's that. And then the highest rung of the ladder is what we would call our oratory scola. This choir handles the more elaborate chants, what we would call the proper of Mass. 
the introit, the gradual, the alleluia, the offertory, the communion, as well as the uh, polyphony, motets, and uh, sacred hymnody that would go in what you might call the auxiliary portions of the liturgy, the distribution of communion, the uh, offertory sometimes, where it's not a set or prescribed text. You, you just need to put something there to adorn the empty space otherwise. Uh, and that's a group that is you know, a little more advanced, right? So it's background is required to get into that one. But with these tiers or these rungs we've created, we've already seen some of the fruits of these things by seeing folks advance up into that group. Um, so that, those uh, rungs, the, the chant class, the preparatory choir, the ordinary choir, and the scola constitute the lion's share of what the sacred music program consists of, to say nothing of organ. Um, but then we have this second uh, part, which we just started this year. Um, we started a nonprofit. Um, uh, operating right now under the auspices of the oratory and in tandem with the mission of the Institute of Christ the King at large, uh, but which is uh, secular by design legally so that we can be entering our name in the hat, so to speak, for the kinds of grants that exist uh, at the state and the national level for arts initiatives. And because the church uh, enjoyed for several centuries the position of primary patron of the arts, we can play in both sandboxes, if that right. makes sense. So things like uh, we have an annual festival that, while centering on a feast day, it's coming up, the Feast of Christ the King on Sunday, October 27th, the titular feast of the order. We will honor that with an orchestral mass. Um, uh, and this year it'll be uh, Franz Joseph Haydn's Lord Nelson Mass with soloists and orchestra. But we will also have augmenting that mass, sort of framing it, a grand dinner for the uh, participants of the festival choir, a, a formal plated dinner that is an opportunity to kind of reinforce etiquette in a formal setting, but also confraternity, as well as a, um, a, a, a craft and events bazaar that will take place all day Sunday when the mass is over with vendors, and a um, ball, a ballroom dancing Saturday night uh, prior to the feast with live music ensemble, playing a repertoire suitable to English country dancing with a caller, um, as well as a, there's one more, oh, and a concert, an open to the public um, admission-based program in the church performed by the Kingsbury Ensemble, uh, St. Louis based, directed by Maurice Carlin, uh, featuring myself in this case on the organ. They don't always do that, but this is going to be called Organ Music of the Mediterranean, and that's uh, Friday night, October 25th, at 8 p.m. We're doing a European-style start time <laughs> a little bit later. So that's the kind of thing that this second division, this nonprofit, will increasingly sort of supervise and provide a professional uh, profile uh, to that we can do more kinds of collaborations with reputable artistic institutions and artists in the St. Louis area in particular. So I tell you, every time that you've had these events and had these opportunities for exposure, it has improved my family's life. Uh, my kids and as Mark as well, our kids have been involved in the choir before and just lifted our whole family up, just being involved with that, learning more about the music. So thank you so much that all of Institute of Christ the King, yourself, provides those opportunities. I, I, I can't express enough my, my gratitude for that, so thank you. Yeah, thank I, you. I would second that. Um, it occurs to me, though, Michael, that I, I think I know the answer, even though he doesn't want the question. I know the answer to what he does in his spare time, and it's sleep. That's right. Because I don't think this man has any spare time. That's, that's an awful lot of initiatives that you've described. And each one is fruitful in a way that um, it's a mutual fruitfulness. So the, the church gains when people develop a talent uh, and then give their talent to the church. But the, the, the singers... Um, would you call them performers? Uh, they gain in their knowledge, sure. and those of us sitting in the pews gain from a greater awareness. So it's, it's a it's a it satisfies at every level some uh, spiritual and intellectual development in in understanding um, what exactly we're listening to. Why is this music structured this way? Why is this being sung at this point in the mass? Right. Um, there's a lot of whys to music, um, liturgical music for sure, but uh, we were discussing before we came on the air, there's, there's a lot of whys in classical music as well. And that's one of the things I think we kind of want to touch on today is the beauty in music is, and why so many of us don't understand it. And perhaps is it that 
our lack of understanding keeps us from actually uh, getting more out get, of get, it. exactly venturing out. And I, I think it's a, a worthwhile topic. And the you know the name of the program is men man to man. And the question here is not necessarily that men do it better or worse than women. I think this is a, a multi-gender, both gender cultural issue and something we want to dive into. But first, I have to say, you're listening to Man to Man, the Man to Man program on St. Joseph Radio, coming to you from St. Louis, Missouri, the Rome of the West. So let's talk a little bit about music and beauty. Um, why is it that if I turn on my radio, mm -hmm. when I leave here today, I'm not going to hear essentially a classical or beautiful mm -hmm. musical piece that's nothing against contemporary music or country mm -hmm. or rock. There, there's certainly a place and there's a value and some beauty in those things. But the, the, the beauty that is um, in some classical pieces is not just realized with your ears. It's realized with your intellect and your mind. And I think that makes it deeper than anything that we could hear on contemporary radio. So why don't we hear that? Why don't we know that? Yeah, I think uh, this resonates with a Thomas Aquinas uh, position on beauty having to do with proportion. And it might be the one of the three elements when we talk about clarity, integrity, and proportion. Those are the Thomistic sort of guideposts for measuring beauty and understanding it. Proportion, I think, is the one that will come up the most maybe in this conversation, especially if we are talking about men, you know, mm -hmm. in particular. Uh, because the question, what I find it tends to become is, um, I think most men and women both can comprehend that a thing can be intrinsically beautiful and objectively beautiful. So it's not my opinion. I just don't get it. I know it's beautiful somehow, and maybe to somebody else. But it's not impacting me somehow. Like, that's, a, that's a good thing to observe because what you're recognizing is, okay, it maybe in theory is beautiful. There's a breakdown in between there and me. And Aquinas talked about that. The, the proportion that's referred to when we talk about beauty is not just referring to the proportion between the integral constituent parts of the thing we're either looking at or listening to. It also exists in the transmission, for lack of a better term, of that thing to us. Maybe a better term would be our own receptivity to it. Can I, do I have the capacity to receive that which is beautiful? And it, is it in gradation? Is it mitigated, right? So when you said turning on the radio, or whether you're going on an app or playing YouTube, a lot of folks, I've seen it, I've, I've been a part of it myself, where you think I should probably culture myself. I'm gonna instead of watching SpongeBob, <laughs> instead of watching SpongeBob SquarePants, I'm gonna listen to five minutes of Mozart. Don't take that away from me. <laughs> and it's, it's like a, it's like somebody getting on the treadmill. I should probably do five minutes. You know, right. I'll listen to Mozart for five minutes. So already, it's almost punitive. But when you when you push play, so many people they're innocently ignorant to this, but they don't realize the first thing you're receiving is that phone, is right. that transistor, right. yes. is that speaker. The music is on the other side of that and a mixer who has, in his own art, kind of processed it so that you're actually having curated for you. The violins are louder in that recording because the, the guy did that on purpose. The oboes, he didn't catch those as much. So you're having it curated to you a bit. But the point is not to say that's somehow ruining it. The point is to say, look at how many layers of mitigation exists between the beauty and mm -hmm. me. We don't even know it's there. It's an invisible blind spot. The, the thing that's getting in the way of our capacity to receive it. And then what happens is the person leaves frustrated. It's like, okay, I did my five minutes, just like you get off the treadmill. I don't look any different five minutes later. I just listened to Mozart for five minutes. I don't feel enlightened. I feel like, okay, now that I've got that done, time for SpongeBob SquarePants again. Right. That natural response, people should know you're missing one of the pieces of proportion, your own capacity to receive it. So that's sort of the question, I think, uh, when we're talking about why if I go anywhere. Uh, whether it's contemporary or classical, if I'm trying to better myself or something in those first few listenings is what, uh, am I really ready to receive this? So a question it leaves me with is what, to what extent can men improve or do they have the ability to expand or contrive their capacity to receive? So overall, when uh, I think it was a week ago, we went to Rachmaninoff's. Um, yes. The symphony. The symphony, yeah. and it was beautiful. Mm -hmm. 
uh, they began with uh, Vespers very quietly, but they were surrounded here at the, at the Basilica mm -hmm. uh, before they went on stage, and it was beautiful. And I would not have experienced that if I had not been there versus it coming across an app or something else. I think that those vibrations, those sounds, what the conductor is trying to transmit to me coming originally from those voices versus getting it over something else. I, I, I love the way you explained that because there is a mitigation there. There is some sort of intervention that I'm only hearing what that person who is dealing with the soundboard is giving me versus hearing it straight from those violins or those pieces that are actually providing that sound to yes. me. It's just beautiful. And you were in the Basilica? Yes. Yeah. Well, yes. there's that too. So yes. the enti your entire environment in that case was beatified. Yes. Yes. In other words, all the mitigation was removed and beauty was liberated. You know, that's a, I think Hildebrand is the one who says the term poeticization of one's space. So this like, poetry, this resonates with poetry more than music, but the idea that we can do something to improve our reception to beauty just by lightly poeticizing our environment. So the Basilica, which is a poeticization on a macro scale, has made it possible for, like yourself, to hear what most of the time is going to be coming by way of a streaming service, restored to its natural habitat. The same way you can, you can pot a plant, and yeah, you can grow that plant in that pot, but how big would it get if it was in the Amazon? Right, right, right. So if Rachmaninoff's Vespers is coming to us from a streaming, even if I got really high quality of these, and I lean back on my sofa, and I've got my martini, and I listen to Rachmaninoff's Vespers that way, I'm mitigating myself. Yes. Because now I'm turning it into a, my personal space, not the poeticized space. But the, the, the basilica gives you the environment that music was written to be in. It's like restoring it to its natural habitat. Very true. I, you know, Michael, when you mentioned the um, live aspect and how the, hearing the music as it was intended to be, it occurred to me part of the beauty of the art of music, especially live music, is technically what you said is true, but at the same time, the conductor plays a hand in that. Yes. And how much of the violins did you really hear versus right. maybe the way the composer Rachmaninoff intended when he wrote that piece. That, to me, is more pure than when it's done through technology. Absolutely. And that's not to minimize sound engineers, and they're, they're incredible. But to be there live and to see that and to feel, you, you literally do feel the music. And this is different than going to, um, I don't know, to see you 2 in concert. You feel that, too. Sure. But it, that's from decibel versus feeling the actual resonating of stringed instruments. Uh, it, it's, it's a totally different experience, and it's one that is um, unfortunately rarely experienced by most people, including men, because I would tell you that uh, some years ago, and when I was still working, uh, for a Christmas party, Christmas outing, I decided it would be interesting to take everybody to the Christmas concert at St. Louis Symphony Hall. And I made the arrangements. We, you know, we had a fine buffet. I mean, the, the people at Powell were, were amazing. Uh, it was a wonderful program that was laid out of Christmas music. And I had several employees tell me that their husbands wouldn't come. And oh, I had gosh. one employee tell me specifically... He wouldn't come because he'd have to get dressed up. That's and a missed opportunity. He only wears T-shirts. And I said, well, I'm sure he would be welcome so we could get past the T-shirt issue. But it was really, that was like a secondary excuse. Right. It was, I don't go to that because I just, that music is boring, it's terrible. And it, it makes me think about that element, the, the genius of a conductor who is drawing out of that piece, drawing out of the, the instruments and the musicians, the sound and the, the, the tempo, the emotion, the passion, there's a tremendous amount of skill and talent and guess what? Work involved in doing that. Amen to that, because I tell you, that, that's another piece to me that resonates is the effort and the prep that goes into what we hear. Yes. I mean, that is the final piece, mm -hmm. but what work went in before that uh, is amazing to me because there's hours of practice that I would expect 
takes to get to that perfection that I'm hearing. That I'm, I just I really appreciate that, and I know you've you've had that in you teaching others. So. Yes. Well, you know, this may be the only time anybody's ever heard beauty compared to sausage. I shared this with you before, <laughs> but I'm gonna for a moment, if you'll go with me here. If it's good sausage, well, there's an expression. Uh, you wouldn't eat sausage if you knew how it was made, yes. or a variation. You wouldn't yes. eat sausage if you saw what went into it. Right. Um, there's a lot of, within a certain population today, 20, 2024, there's a, there's a considerable number of people who are concerned about the loss of beauty, want to help. Sometimes the language is restorative. They want to restore beauty, bring back, which implies we're bringing back something from the past, a golden age perhaps. But what I don't see so much recognized is the difficulty. There's almost this idea that um, all we need to do is get things looking a little nicer. Like yeah. that man, instead of that t-shirt, put on a suit. There you go, now we're getting one step closer to be, okay. But the real, what it would really look like, real beauty, um, to get that really back, okay, uh, it's much, much harder than it looks. And I would even go as far to say, you might not want anything to do with it if you saw what went into it. Now we could, I could of course take advantage of the opportunity and say, oh, you guys, I appreciate so much acknowledging what we musicians go through, right? Mm -hmm. But that will quickly turn into a pity project for right. myself. So no. I, I want a better analogy here, and that's the face of God. Right. So the face of God is the final arbiter. That's the gold standard for beauty. Um, it's, not, it's not symphonies. It's not anything a musician does. The face of God sits high and above all that and informs what anything else trying to imitate that or emulate that will, will do. So what do we know about the face of God? Well, we hear it talked about largely in Exodus. And what does the face of God do? Well, the first thing that says about it is, no man may look at it and survive. Right. All right. So, this, so gold, scary thought. Gold standard of the gold standard of beauty has a, a effect not so much of a poeticization as much as lethality. That's the first thing to keep in mind. Your own perishing, your mortality is drawn into question when you see it. And then the next thing we hear about it is the first guy, if you will, who got to see it and walk away alive. That was Moses. And Aaron sees fit to veil him, cover him up, because as Exodus says. The Israelites wouldn't draw near if they saw what that did to him, mm -hmm. encountering true beauty face to face. They would be frightened, it says, uh, his appearance. Well, we're going to come back to that thought as soon as we come back from this break. This is the Man to Man program. You're listening to us from St. Joseph Radio here in St. Louis, Missouri, the Rome of the West and the home of the word no from now until November 5th. Vote no, folks. I'm with, we are with, our special guest, James Mark. Thank you. Hi, this is Matt Logeman with St. Joseph Radio with a great gift idea. A St. Benedict bracelet, a trendy accessory for men, women, and children that not only looks good on everyone's wrist, but is actually armor for the spiritual battlefield. This unique bracelet is handmade in Europe and contains 10 medals within the braided cord in the adult size and 7 medals in the children's size. On the front of each beautiful medal is St. Benedict holding a cross in his right hand, the object of his devotion. On the back of each medal is a cross. Surrounding the back of the medal and cross are the letters V. R-S-N... M V S M Q L I V B in Latin reference which translates Be gone, Satan. Never tempt me with your vanities. What you offer me is evil. Drink the poison yourself. And finally located at the top is the word Pax which means peace. All bracelets come packaged with an informational card and the St. Benedict blessing which your local priest can administer. This gift is for everyone you love and care about, including yourself. Available from St. Joseph Radio. Check the website at www.saintjosephradio.net St. Joseph Catholic Radio is proud to announce the launch of SJEN-TV, the St. Joseph Evangelization Network. SJEN-TV is a premier online Catholic broadcasting network providing quality Catholic programming 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. We have programming such as live studio interviews, St. Joe's Java speaker presentations, current Catholic issues, and the Pro-Life series. We're featuring the many talented speakers out of Orange County, California, and this Archdiocese of St. Louis, Missouri. 
Missouri, including Professor John Gresham, Father James Mason, Karen Nokemper, Rick Hollerick, Bill Federer, and many more. To review the program list, go to sjen.tv or on Roku, sjen.tv. All this programming is free, and we are welcoming sponsorship of new programs. Find out more at sjen.tv. Hello, everyone. I'm Mark Serafino, my co-host, Michael Hayworth, and this is the Man to Man program with our special guest, James Mark, who I so rudely interrupted when we went to that break. My pleasure. James, when we left, you were talking about the face of God. Yes. So, again, face of God and, and this idea that, A, it would kill you to see it, um, B, God seems to have availed that opportunity to a man without killing him, and it was Moses, but it left him so rendered. Uh, and as the, the word is radiant, actually, he became so radiant, that the idea was we need to veil this. We need to hide this from the Israelites, which I interpret when we're talking about men in relationship to beauty is once a man has actually seen beauty, it's interesting to note that he comes across as intimidating or frightening to other people. Um, I think this is what we mean by gravitas, when a man has it. He's seen or been through something. I, I, I analogize this to the first time I ever met a real current war veteran, as opposed to a veteran of a war that was a long time ago. So somebody who had just gotten back, he was not much older than I was from, it was then Iraq. You could tell he'd seen some yes. stuff. Yes. And the way you could tell was not because he was depressed. He wasn't uh, mumbly, so stoic but he was hurt. And you could tell he carried a wound from that. And he was clear thinking, and when he spoke he didn't stutter. This is very, we, we consider this an attribute, one of the attractive attributes of masculinity. So a, a person who can be a port in a storm, who can be, and sometimes it takes those hits, right? So it's interesting that this, this language of the face of God causing one to either perish or be blinded is picked up again by John of the Cross uh, in the Middle Ages when he writes his treatise, The Dark Night of the Soul. That dark night is not referring to the way it's been, that, that particular content has been sort of commandeered by a lot of uh, faithless uh, people who have spun it to mean just sadness, if you, darkness means sadness. But John of the Cross is talking about, no, that darkness is like, what happens when you look at the sun? If you look directly at the sun, you go blind, yep. right? So think about that. Looking at the source of light causes you to lose sight. We need light to see. So looking at the source of the thing we need to see blinds us. How ironic is that? So the dark night refers to your journey to the face of God. Your first encounter, you're going to go blind. You lose your sight, and now you're wandering in the dark. And that is, as he calls that the novitiate stage. Well, you're going to progress in holiness and through mostly humiliating experiences, good humiliation, yes. you're going to become what? More holy. Well, we can walk that right back to masculinity. It's even in these kind of new initiatives that are popping up to try to get men, guys more manly. You have these like week-long excursions into the woods where we're just going to do push-ups every morning at five and we're going to take cold showers only. We're not going to eat. They're on the right track because they have recognized there's a connection between those put-downs, those, those self-injuries and those denials, self-denials. It's like a type of humiliation. You're being brought low in a good way in order to be built up. Well, that's exactly what Dark Knight is. Well, where does it all peak? Where does it all paramount? What does the perfection look like? Some cite sainthood, which is correct. Sainthood is considered you have, the soul has been perfected. Of course, we can cite the Blessed Mother, the only soul to have really achieved true perfection beyond anything we could because of her grace. But then we also have the person of Christ, and this is where a debate exists, even among Catholics, devout Catholics, where uh, then Cardinal Ratzinger, now Pope Emeritus Benedict the late, um, would have this debate, I think it was in the early 90s and through the 2000s, and it was basically put like this, if I could paraphrase it, and at the risk of oversimplifying it. True or false, the crucifixion is beautiful. Because if it is, wow. <laughs> and if it's not, well, what are we saying, right? So right. the true perf perfect person, as we say in the Gloria, only you are holy, tu solus sanctus, is referring to Jesus Christ and his paramount moment in salvation is literally hanging on the cross. Now, if that's the face of God for us, what, is, what does Christ see? I've always thought it'd be interesting to have like a panoramic depiction, the crucifixion, but it's from Christ's perspective. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the skyline of Jerusalem, all the angry people down below, except for his mother and his friend. But I think, no, I think we, we get a hint of what he's seeing when he says what he says, hanging there. It goes, it goes back to the first thing you said, which was why? 
-hmm. There's a lot of whys in classical music. What do you know? The perfected soul, second person of the Trinity, sharing in omniscience, supposedly that means you know everything, says the word why. How could an omniscient being say something that ends in a question mark? Unless there's more to saying why than seeking data. I mean, imagine how absurd it would be if God had answered. Oh, I'm so glad you asked. Here's what happened. Man sinned, and then he basically walks through the hole. This is not going to make Christ feel better hanging on the cross. So, and he had to know. So, this is also the new Adam we're talking about. Adam was made to wonder, not to know. Men are made to go. Why? Not, let me tell you why. Right. And so, he gives us the example. He goes before us in all things, including wonder. The God who knows everything goes, how about that? And it's in the moment of his most brutal moment. It's what every push-up or cold shower in these initiatives tries to emulate on a smaller scale to get men manly, right? So I think it's important, and I may have just made enemies with listeners. I believe the crucifixion is beautiful. And I think it's very important for men to see the beauty in that sacrifice, in that what we might call ugly aesthetically, the bleeding, the bruising, the crowning, the thorns, the, the whole accoutrement of the torture. Uh, but if you take that out of the equation, all you have left is what you might call aesthetic beauty, which is intrinsically innocent, it's neutral, but boy, can you commandeer it fast. So we live in a world of aesthetic beauty. I mean, where our culture is today, the, the beauty that, that we um, are sold and, and uh, the images that are presented to us are very much aesthetic. We don't see behind the, that. The fundamental structure. Exactly. We do not see that. And as part of the, the cause and a large part of where we are today, that men don't recognize beauty as men maybe centuries ago did. Um, why did men of the Middle Ages and, and before and later recognize a beautiful piece of art, a beautiful sculpture, a beautiful uh, bit of music that was composed and, and played? They understood that, they appreciated it, and they loved it at a level that our modern man not only can't, it's almost like a badge of honor for today's man to be able to say, well, I don't do that. I'm not going to the right. symphony. And that you know, that's beneath right. me. That music is boring. It's terrible. And, and I, part of one of the questions I have for you is that going back to I get in my car, I turn on the radio and play it, put a top 40 station on. The songs are different. And as different as they are, they're the same. The beat is the same. The, 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 the drive, the intensity, you know, the lyrics change, the keys change. But at the end of the day, at a certain point, if you're not paying attention, you can almost lose track of what song is playing. Sure. You're more attuned to the beat. And that makes music simple. Simple intellectually, simple in performance. And it's easier then. But if I go to, and we were talking before the program started, Going to a, a symphony, a concert, to hear a piece performed, to be able to do a little bit of background research before you go to understand what was going on in the world when this composer wrote this. Why did he write this piece? What is he trying to convey in this piece? It's, this is a really bad analogy, but to me, it's kind of like tomorrow's a Sunday. How many people around the United States will be sitting in front of their television tomorrow hearing about how a particular NFL team, that coach that week, recognized that the team we're playing does this, this is how we're going to counteract that, all of the steps to prepare, and then go out on that day and play the game. But while they're playing the game, we, the viewers, are being told all of the steps that were done in preparation for that day. We buy that, no problem. We watch it, it's extremely right. entertaining. And in truth, it can almost be boring at times because it, it, the dimension isn't there. The football game is a football game. It's 60 minutes. Mm. You know, the, the, the rules mm. are what they are. Yet in a, in a classical piece, there could be so much more depth and meaning. Yes. Well, I was going to go far. I hadn't thought of that analogy before, that what you're talking about, the prep for the, like, say, Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. I remember also uh, there's the shows that go on and on for hours afterwards. The yes. data analysis of what just yes. happened. So the conversation just keeps going. <laughs> yes. we're gonna, now we're going to dissect this. Can you imagine if they did it for symphonies? It's like once it's all over. Yeah. Well, Mike, what did you think of that one cadenza? It would probably nobody would listen, right? right. But no. what you've identified is the much, much larger topic 
of the sports versus music investment, which, yes. Uh, yes, it's true. Anything we do, I, when you said tomorrow Sunday, I thought maybe where you were going with that was that people are going to read the, the readings when they go to Mass. <laughs> Sadly, <laughs> almost, no. <laughs> almost anything we do could use a little more preparation, but there's a lot to be said of that. Um, the things that people don't have to be coerced into doing, they will watch those sports analysis. Yes. They will follow the stats. They are fans. And that kind of makes us go back, say, okay, what happened here between music and sports? There's many theories. Um, I mean, do we have any? <laughs> I know I've got my own, but. Well, uh, this is going back to, you know, the, the emphasis on what you mentioned on the beat. Mm -hmm. uh, I watched this one show. I think it was something uh, we were friends or something like that. And the DJ in this instance understood, I almost think scientifically, what he can do to get a crowd up yes. and what he can get a, a crowd to do. When it comes to this EMD music, I mean, mm -hmm. it, it has a purpose. Right. It has a drive. So you're looking at it and going, okay, when music is used in these instances, they, they have a purpose in mind. And when I listen to sacred music or classical music, it has a purpose in mind too, but it calms, to me, it calms my soul. It doesn't drive me into this direction of frenzy. Um, so, so that's one of the things I keep thinking about when you mention prep. I think somebody that is a DJ that knows his job to get people to you know, do what they do at raves, he knows what his job is. <laughs> Uh -huh. So I look at you know that uh, effort you're talking about on this particular subject of classical music and its purpose has a completely different outcome, has a completely different uh, intent. Mm -hmm. And that's what I appreciate is that you know what you're doing. I really appreciate that because without that, we can be driven into a lot of different directions that are unnecessary. Sure, sure, sure. Well, I'll add when, I've, when you ask that question, um, this is really horrible, but the... We can't bet on a symphony. Right. No. There's no, there's no outcome. There are no odds on whether or not the, the Mozart piece will finish as it usually finishes. Yeah. So it's vice. Yes. Vice is the, the, the key element that's added, uh, there, and there's others that go with it, right? But that one is, especially today, hugely, hugely um, impregnated into all of sports, not just what's going to happen tomorrow on Sunday. So... We've enticed people, we've enticed men, women too, to, to let's gamble on the game, it'll make it more exciting, it'll make it more interesting, and it, 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 it fine, if you're listening and you bet on games, go for it, That's, that happens not to be something that is appealing to me, bet with your head, not over it, but if you're doing that, um, it does leave kind of a, it creates an intellectual desert. Yes. Um, as much as you may want to know about a player and who's favored and who's doing this, tomorrow, do you take anything home with that other than whether you won or lost? And think about the word that you use there is vice. Yes. Every time I think of it, I thought, okay, that's a bad thing. Or you're doing something. But it is a grip. Yes. And to me, with classical or, or uh, um, um, music that inspires the soul, it's a freedom. Yes. It allows me to wonder. That's the thing that I keep going back to that you mentioned before. Is like, I can be there and wonder about things that are uplifting, not about did I did I put the right amount of money on the right th the thing? Am I am I doing what everything else is asking me to do? I mean, it just it, it drives you in a different. Well, you direction. engage so many more of your senses. Yes, when you're when you're listening to music, especially live, but in in any way. You're engaging them in a different way, and you're, you're certainly engaging your intellect along with your emotion, with you know, so much that goes with it. Then um, one could argue the same thing with watching a football game. Again, sure, absolutely. I just don't know that it has the same sustainability right. in, a, in a daily aspect in your life. You know, it, I don't know that it's the type of thing that helps you to grow intellectually. And if we've done our work and understood uh, purposes or the background of how that mu music was developed. It, men it mentions history. Yes. It talks about the time and brings that forward to understand. I think music transcends a lot of things where it comes to some of the events that was going on at the time. Can you imagine being able to do that in another medium? I, I don't know how that would happen. I don't, I don't know either. Um, you know, Pope Benedict XVI said, the music is capable of opening minds and hearts to the dimension of the spirit 
and leads people to lift their gaze to the Most High, to open themselves to the absolute good and beauty whose ultimate source is in God. I ask myself, truly, Mark, all of the music that you listen to, does all the music you listen to fit that description? Mm -hmm. Can I listen to something today, driving home, and say, yeah, that kind of falls in line with what Pope Benedict was saying. Uh, folks, no. No, I need to do a better job in that, uh, and at least a better job in the awareness of where this might be taking me, and is it expanding my intellect? So here I am accusing people that I don't even know of living in an intellectual desert, and I'm telling you I'm a prisoner to it too. And we need to, uh, all of us, try to find a way to free ourselves from that. And, you know, there's something else that I have to say, and it is you're listening to Man to Man on St. Joseph Radio coming to you from St. Louis, Missouri. My co-host, Mike Hayworth, I'm Mark Serafino, and we have a very special guest with us, James Mark. So that's my comment on gambling and sports and music. <laughs> it's but great. Think about the, what, I, what I enjoy is that uh, we have so many opportunities here in St. Louis to expose ourselves to the right music. Um, when I say right music, things that are, are uplifting and beautiful. And we should take advantage of those as much as we can, wherever yes. it is offered. So, yes. And we have those, mm -hmm. but what's, what's very frightful is that while we have them now, I'm not convinced that we're actually building for tomorrow. Right. Where are, uh, this is something I was talking with someone earlier today, are young boys being taught musical instruments? Are they being encouraged to play the cello, the violin, the bassoon? I, I don't know, but hopefully there's an instrument that's promoting that. But the, I do know that the school systems cut back, budgets have cut back, so music is not being developed the way it once was. Right. We have an obligation to promote that as best we can, and it sounds like the organization you talked about earlier might lean towards that by providing at least opportunities where people can hear good music. Yes. Yeah, there's a number of things to unpack there, going all the way back to the vice grip analogy. So I'm just going to say that so I don't forget. I'm going to, because it resonated again when the quote you cited includes him saying, Open your hearts to this. Yes. Um, and then what you just said about public school. So I'll, I'll, I'll tie all of that kind of together when it comes to men, boys, music, but even what we're trying to do with the oratory. Um, back to that thing about our proportion and our capacity to receive beauty for men, we're going to struggle with something, and that's going to be vulnerability. We are often in a uh, paralysis, and that's why I think about when you said the vice grip, men suffer from paralysis. It happens any number of places, but the three places I keep hearing it mentioned in forums on this topic are not necessarily music, but I'll walk back to it. Guys who are just starting out in life in any kind of way beyond living with their parents, getting a job, going to the interview, <laughs> the paralysis, the paralysis there. Yes. On a date with the complications econ socioeconomic today, guys don't even know if they're supposed to pay. Right. They're supposed to open the door. Will she see me as misogynistic if I do that? So he, what does he do? Nothing. He right. freezes. And so it's paralysis. Then let's say a marriage has happened. It's like, does he really assert his position as head of the household? Does he let his wife walk on him, right? Mostly paralysis will say, go ahead and walk on me, right? So there's these different things. It's also going to happen if he's in the face of anything he finds beautiful. There is a culture in place that uh, a man might know right away, yes, that's beautiful, but I can't, I can't show it. I can't acknowledge it, mm -hmm. not even to myself. So now what happens is, they go to the spaces where it's acceptable to show you care, and that's those. That's what the gambling is. That's what the cheers are from the sideline. That's what the fight with the coach is. When a dad shouts, "My son, uh, you, why, why do you put him on right. the bench?" Uh, clearly, they care. The yes. emotions are very high. So men can be emotional. They can get invested in something, but it doesn't require them to be vulnerable. Um, in all of those cases, they're asserting what they know. It comes back to this refusal to say "ah" in a moment of beauty. So when you go to tackle the issue of, okay, the public schools think, and it was much worse, it is much worse after the pandemic, you can't get the kids to sit still, to learn, uh, sit still, let alone hold a violin, right, without destroying it. And then you've got the boy situation. They say, ah, music is for girls. What's step one to fixing all this? There's been all these theories, but I believe it, men have to exemplify vulnerability coming from a man. So I think about, there's a line from the Song of Songs, and, uh, it's the, the English translation is 
Uh, I'll say the Latin first because it's got a Latin word in it that is root to a few other words that can be useful for a conversation. Um, vulnerasti, vulnerasti cord meum in uno oculorum tuorum. That just means, you can hear the word vulnerable there. Yes. Vulnerasti, but what does it mean? It means I am wounded, or more specifically, you have wounded me within one glance. And this is the bridegroom speaking to the bride, which serves as an analogy for there's the steps right there. A man follows those steps. You simply, and the first thing you can do before you talk about initiatives and programs and all that is can you even say, I'm wounded? to yourself. Mm -hmm. Or do you say, well, I'm wounded, but nobody can know that. Right. Because if, no, if people knew that, if my wife knew that, if my kids right. knew that, if my girlfriend knew that, they'd give up hope in me, they'd give up faith right. in me. Can I say I'm wounded even to God and myself? That's the first step. So when your question about the boys, are they getting taught that? It's a fight. It's a big fight. And it gets worse in situations where uh, the, the boy is being thrown between two households. Oh. What will oh. often happen is uh, a weaponization of the music. So the guy, the dad, often, not always, but often, will be the one who says, music is for women, your mom is just wanting you to do that, to vilify me. And then she'll say, you need to, to the son, you need to be music, don't listen to your dad. So now, the boy in that case is caught in the crossfire, and music becomes this association with, it's like, it's not hopeless, but this is what we're facing. And we wonder why that boy struggles with anxiety. Right. Uh, and in often cases, I would imagine, chooses neither one and maybe chooses something worse. Yes. Yes. So I think that men, male instruction. Mm -hmm. Why? Because male instructors don't have to be Mozart. They just need to have the ability to be vulnerable. Right. Not in a way that is creepy, but gives the example. A child is playing, let's say they get it right. Let's say all they got right was their thumb was in the right place at the right time. You say, how about that? <laughs> you don't just say, correct, next task. Right, you, know, right. uh, you take a moment to think about how great that victory is for a child who's still learning the difference between their pinky right. and their thumb. And this is something I run into a lot with the projects we do at the oratories. Every once in a while, I'll ask for help. I need some teachers. Can, can people help teach? People come forward, but what more often I have, and this is sort of the problem, is there's too many people that want to be the curators, not the cultivators. They don't actually want to foster a child from the beginning or an adult from the beginning. They want them already halfway done, basically, sure. and then they're going to pass themselves off as their talent agent. What we really need are people who are willing to get down in the trenches where it's not glamorous yet. It's still a child, or it's a beginning adult. They don't know what to do. And that's where your exposure and examples of vulnerability are the most important. Because then a young boy can immediately go, oh, this is manly. Yeah. That's, that's done day one. Yep. But if he lives with that anxiety and he doesn't get the affirmation, he'll live the rest of his life thinking, I'm supposed to be a bearded, tatted up, shaved head guy <laughs> that runs a farm with my bare hands. This is a big right. movement right now. Right. And now yes. some of those guys are rapping now. It's kind of interesting. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. But, but anyway, uh, that's not to paint a dismal picture. It's to say, I do have faith in that part. I know right. that when I look back on my childhood, I took it for granted. Oh, I had, I had men in my life that were vulnerable in front of me. I didn't yes. realize it made a difference. Right. And that, I meet kids that never had it. That's an so. excellent point. It does make a, a tremendous difference. And, you know, I, I want to just go back and touch on athletics for a moment and say that um, the first true sym symphony I went to, I took uh, several of my children to see um, Handel's Messiah. And they were very concerned about their dad. They were concerned that I wasn't going to be able to handle it, that I wasn't going to like it, that I might be, you know, immersed in my work on my phone instead of watching, and and you know, kind of understood why they felt that way. And uh, so we went. It was um, David Robertson was our conductor at that time, and f my first exposure. And I'm watching this man conduct, and I was so taken by his movement, by his motion by the obvious preparation, by the way the orchestra responded to him, that I felt as if I was at a sporting event. Right. And afterwards, you know, my kids were like, so what did you think? And I said, that man's one of the best athletes I've ever seen. <laughs> right. I mean, right. his movement, he was so passionate. There were times I thought he was going to fall off the platform, mm -hmm. you know, because he was so emphatic in the way he conducted. And the way they responded to him, for me, I was very blessed to realize this is very much like watching an excellent play at, at a particular sport like uh, yes yes because there was so much talent and skill that was involved so 
There is a parallel to athletics. Um, men, fathers, if you're out there, don't just look at it as that's boring, I have to get dressed up. Go and appreciate everything that you see and everything that you hear um, and just embrace it. Let it happen. Watch, look, and listen. Don't just go and kind of brace up the way my kids thought I was going to do and immerse <laughs> myself in my, my own mind. So my name is Mark Serafino. My co-host is Michael Hayworth. Uh, our guest has been James Mark. We are very, very happy to have had you here, James, today. Thank you so um, much. Thank you. Awesome conversation. I was wondering, um, as we come to a close, if maybe you could just share some more thoughts about the upcoming music festival sure. and, uh, and tell us what, uh, what else is going to be going on at the St. Francis de Sales in the coming months. So we have our annual Christ the King Festival that will happen on Sunday, October 27th. We're featuring Lord Nelson uh, Orchestral Mass at 10.30 on Sunday morning. And uh, yeah, that, that's probably the most important thing to know about is the end of the month, the Feast of our Lord Jesus Christ the King. Well, thanks for joining us. You've been listening to St. Joseph Radio Presents from the Rome of the West, St. Louis, Missouri. If you would like to join us in our evangelization efforts, you can order a copy of today's broadcast or any of our past programs by visiting us on our website, stjosephradio.net. That's S-A-I-N-T, josephradio.net. Or call us, 636-447-6000. It's all at your fingertips to help us evangelize the world, bringing the good news of Christ to everyone you meet and change one soul at a time. Thank you for your prayers and support. Until next time, may God bless you and your family. This has been a presentation of St. Joseph Radio Presents.